Hello and welcome to the India Australia Roundtable. Our two Prime Ministers have referred to our countries as natural partners. So this week on the Roundtable, we are going to try and explore what the synergies are in common, what the takeaways are and how we can take that forward. I'm joined by a panel of experts. I have with me uh, Dr. William Crow. He, is a, he has a PhD in aerospace engineering and he also co-founded the High Earth Orbit Ro Robotics who utilize asteroid resources. Nazia Aram, she's a manager, advocacy and media at the Indians for Amnesty International. And she's also written a book, Ma Mothering a Muslim. That's a very interesting topic to choose. And we have uh, Simon O'Connor. He's an advisor, North Asia, in the Australian Prime Minister's office. But he's also uh, been with the Australian High Commission here in India for three years. And he's focusing basically on North Asia policy support for the Australian Prime Minister's engagement in North Asia. I have uh, Anaika Wells, she is an MP and the youngest woman in the House of Representatives and she also drives uh, policy for sustainable development, that's an area of interest for her. We have an MP from, uh, Andhra, from Guntur, Andhra Pradesh, uh, Krishna Lavu, he's on the standing committee of HRD and he's also the vice chairman of the Wigman group of institutions which has at many as 45,000 students. So if education is I think an obvious area of interest for you. And Stanley Johnny, he's, an, he's the International Affairs Editor at The Hindu. He's also written a book, The ISIS Caliphate from Syria to the Doorsteps of India. He holds a PhD in West Asian Studies. Um, I'm going to begin with you, uh, since you, you, know, you have uh, obvious, uh, well, you've seen both the countries, you have uh, experience here and uh, from Australia. Uh, where do you see the synergies working? You know, where do you think that India and Australia can actually work to meet and take this partnership forward? So I think uh, for a, a long time, uh, the Australia-India uh, relationship has really been driven by a lot of the political and strategic overlap in our interests. And uh, as a result, you've seen some really strong high-level political engagement emerging. We have uh, increasing cooperation in the region when it comes to our uh, defence relationship, when it comes to our security cooperation. Um, and as a result, that's really seen an uptick in, in, a, in, the, relate, in the bilateral relationship work and uh, a lot of the architecture around that. I think uh, where there's perhaps the, the scope to, to step up is, is perhaps in our economic engagement. Mm. And in recognition of that, back in 2017, that's when they announced the India economic strategy would be developed by uh, our former High Commissioner to India and our former our Foreign Secretary, Peter Varghese. And that was an effort to really identify a long-term strategic vision for the economic relationship because it was identified as an area that had significant scope to improve. So his uh, model was presented and, and provides a bit of a blueprint for the government to, and the business community in Australia to identify where there are the best access points into, uh, into India. Uh, and as a result... And these are? Uh, so they've done, uh, the best way to describe it is a states and sectors approach. So there are 10 priority states and 10 priority sectors that are identified. Uh, and I won't go into the, all, the, all the depth and, and, and bore everyone, but um, broadly speaking, there are areas which are really established in our economic relationship, uh, including our education sector and our resources cooperation. But then there are also areas which have been identified as uh, priority areas with significant scope for development and uh, a, an area where there's synergy between Australia's economy and, and India's economy. Uh, areas such as uh, health, uh, sports administration, uh, infrastructure and consulting. Uh, and those, those aspects are where we're starting to see some of those gains come to fruition. Okay. Your first thoughts? Well, for me, I think as a newly elected MP, I've only been elected since the elections in Australia last year. Okay. It's very important for me to get to know all of my constituents. And for me, that's, um, it's important to get to know my Indian communities because after English, Punjabi is the language most spoken in my constituency of Lily, and Hindu is the most common religion after the religion mm -hmm. of Christianity. So I need to get, my, get to know my Indian community and this dialogue is important in terms of learning what kind of values and principles they're likely to bring from the Indian culture as well as the sort of domestic issues that we're looking at on the ground. Though I was just discussing with my colleague Krishna here, the scale is quite different and that's in both the respect of parliamentary democracy and our economies and, and many other elements that we'll, I'm sure we'll get to. The scale is so different. I represent 105,000 constituents as a federal constituency in Australia. Krishna represents nearly 3 million in yeah. the federal parliament of India. Scale is important. 
scale is very important. And some of the areas that he mentioned, I think education is something that we, as I mentioned earlier, that you are looking for something. Uh, since you've dealt with education, vocational training is something that India does neglect and I think Australia lays a lot of importance too. So, do you see some kind of tie-ups happening? Coming to education, um, vocational education as well as uh, higher education, both of them, uh, there is a synergy that can happen. Right now, uh, the only engagement that is happening with uh, Australia is uh, um, Australian universities focusing on a young crowd that is in either in India or China, just uh, taking them out, flushing them out, I should say, <laughs> uh, uh, so that they can fund the universities back in uh, um, Australia. Mm -hmm. But uh, nothing's coming from that side to this side, Correct. from Australian side to this side. No, no, no investments are coming in. No. Um, no, no research funding is coming in. Not it's something, some little bit is coming, but not any big amounts are coming in. So, uh, as I was uh, reading up, uh, there's almost 85 percent in service sector is uh, is done by education. Education imports. That's what. I, if, correct me if I'm wrong. So that's a huge uh, outflow that is happening from uh, Indian side into Australia. But uh, so that is where the engagement can happen. Um, uh, maybe uh, take it to the next level, meaningful and next level uh, partnerships wherein engagement wherein Australian universities and Australian vocational education can actually come into India and uh, uh, do some uh, uh, creative and meaningful uh, because uh, uh, education, foreign investments into India is a uh, no, no, yeah, no, no. But uh, see, for example, British Council does some creative investments in India. Uh, Cambridge uh, Press does some creative investments in India. But we don't see Australian universities doing that sort of creative investments uh, in India, uh, so that higher education as well as vocational education. Vocational education, I believe, uh, the TAFE is really, really good. TAFE Australia is really good, uh, really, really good. But uh, I don't see them expanding or trying to tie up with any of the uh, any of the colleges or universities here. What would we have? Coming, yeah? Well, I, I might just uh, um, suggest that when we look at the education relationship, so there, there is, you're, I would absolutely agree that there is a, a big part of that is the flow of students from India um, to Australia. Uh, but I think what we're starting to see now is, is uh, a growing, uh, broader cooperation when it comes to education and a couple of examples include uh, qualification recognition and qualification services where uni <coughs> excuse me, universities uh, and TAFEs that provide those qualifications are coming to India and setting up uh, providing those services and they're pursuing a bit of the trainer, the trainer, training the trainer model. So rather than delivering the training to students or you know professionals mm -hmm. in India, what they're providing is training to the trainers who will then deliver that in India to their services. So there, there are different models that work and, and what works for the, the US or the UK and India may not be the best model for, for Australian one. Um, but universities are definitely trying to look at more um, opportunities for engagement in India. And the other example I'd point towards where the government prioritizes hmm. the um, you know, research element of things is that the largest fund that the Australian government provides is with India, is the Australia India Science and Research Fund, um, which is uh, millions some and millions claps of dollars. In the dollars. background, which is not <laughs> part of the show, but it worked. Um, and, and, and so for, for us, we prioritise that because we know that India has huge um, uh, capabilities when it comes to science and research and, te uh, and technology. And so that's where there's another element where we're trying to build another layer of, of uh, But that's engagement. where the sticking point comes, understandably. We are uh, hassled, we are upset about the concern about the visa restrictions that are put to us over there in Australia. So, I mean, he's saying yes, welcome, but at the end of the day, there are these hurdles that are there. Yeah, that's true. Uh, while everybody is agreeing that the broader framework for deepening relationship between these two countries uh, is economy. Um, because there is a quest on both sides to deepen the economic partnership. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are several structural challenges remain. One is, of course, the visa restrictions is there. And then overall, if you look at you know, the terms of the economic cooperation, uh, see, uh, Prime Minister Modi, when he visited Australia in 2014, he said that, uh, yeah, we have to uh, really speed up the process of uh, bilateral uh, trade negotiations. But mm -hmm. Six years down the line, I don't think that the trade talks have reached anywhere, any conclusive stage. Mm. 
And also then there were uh, talks about the RCEP, where yes. India, initially India was interested in joining RCEP, but a few months ago, uh, the Prime Minister announced that India was pulling back from RCEP. Because I think the main challenge, main concerns is that Indian, from an Indian agricultural point of view, uh, India thinks that if India liberalizes its uh, uh, economy further, uh, yeah. the farmers Start would the be farmer. hit. Yeah. yeah, farmers' interest would be hit by uh, uh, when when Australian products, farm goods, or other products enter the Indian market. Mm -hmm. So the the point is that uh, while both sides agree uh, that uh, the future is deepening, further deepening economic partnership, uh, there are structural issues still remaining on the table. So even if uh, even if India and Australia are going to conclude bilateral trade talks, or if India's interest in RCEP is going to be rekindled in the future, I think the key is to address these structural issues. Only then, I think, we will see some uh, tangible results on the, uh, uh, in, 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 in the eventuality. Coming up, yeah. Yeah, could I, could I um, tag on to that? So um, first, firstly, addressing visas. So in the space sector, we've seen it as a real priority sector for Australia. Um, so what we've done is actually uh, liberalize our visa system for that specific industry. Um, and I do know of uh, Indian specialists uh, coming over and helping Australian companies and, and getting employment in that way, which is really incredibly exciting. And I think actually sp space might be one of those industries that could really uh, lead this charge of cooperation and collaboration. So both India and Australia have specific needs um, uh, around defense products for space, but also around civilian products and how do we inspire our nations. Um, and Australia's been very aggressive in setting um, fantastic uh, goals with the US as an example. We've set aside $150 million um, over the next several years to help NASA go back to the moon. Um, and I feel like there's, there's a lot of synergies between Australia and, and India in terms of the direction we're going in both the civilian and um, defense sense as well. So at high earth orbit robotics, our goal is to mine asteroids or to produce the data to mine asteroids, but we currently use the same data um, to help uh, our defense force and also civilian um, satellite operators look at their satellites and provide health analytics. And we'd love to do that uh, with the Indian market as well. Um, but also we need to buy products from the Indian market. So India has fantastic launch vehicles, the PSLV um, and GSLV series are great examples. Um, and India is doing fantastic things with satellite technology as well. So I'd love to see the two countries collaborate more in that sector. And I think it's a, it could be a real catalyst for change um, in terms of collaborating better between the two countries. Nazir, your first thoughts? Well, I know economic uh, reasons and uh, political reasons you take precedence. <laughs> no, I'm very but, happy with you know, it. All these things are driven by people. And people are driven by the ties that hold them together. Mm. So what are the ties that hold Australia and India together? That would be my first question. Um, I would take a step back and I see many things beyond economics and trade that we can look at. There are so many things in common like climate change, like uh, 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 gender and diversity. Uh, uh, I believe both the parliaments are struggling with women representation, <laughs> uh, adequate women representation, and uh, Islamophobia. So um, they are, these are like these are issues that both countries are battling with. They both are lively democracies, and we need to see uh, we need to go beyond trade and economics. It's when people come together, there'll be many more things that will start happening. Now on that note, we need to take a short break, but stay with us, we're going to come back and talk a lot more about what we have in common, what are the sticking points and how do we go beyond those. So stay with us. Hello and welcome back to the India Australia Roundtable. Um, you know, we've kind of outlined the key areas, but now you know, on, on to more specifics, you know, for instance, say India needs infrastructure, we don't have much investment from the Australian, you know, you have your pension funds or whatever, which can invest. Is, the, is there some way of, you know, you, I know there's a whole economic blueprint that is there, but uh, do we see any of that happening? So I think it's identified, when we look at the economic engagement, part of it is understanding where the value add is, where, do, where is there the complementarity huh. between the economies. And um, 
I don't think purely by the si you know, our, our size and, and where our investment goes, you're probably not going to see the, the volume of investment that India you know, is probably requiring for its infrastructure uh, needs over the short term. Uh, that's not to say that we're not investing. So I, can, I, I know that uh, in the last couple of years, Macquarie Bank was one of the, the first Australian banks to jump into the market with a $2 billion investment uh, in infrastructure, uh, particularly around the Maharashtra um, region. Uh, so there is, there is that uh, investment, but it's probably not of the scale that, that is going to meet uh, the FDI needs of India. But where there is a particular focus at the moment with uh, Australia and India, and also with other partners in the region, with Japan and, and the US, um, is on our um, consulting services that go with developing the projects and the skills that go behind the implementation, the design and implementation of infrastructure projects. Uh, so it's not, it's not purely through the lens of investment where we look at cooperation. There's also the other aspects where we have maybe the skills, experience, um, the capabilities to add value to a project, to identify where there are needs or how it can be done, and through the implementation side. And I think it's all, the other part that I would add to that is where there is um, capacity to bring other players into the, uh, into the tent, so to speak, about, uh, for example, Japan has been investing a huge amount in India and in, in infrastructure needs. And we also work closely with Japan and the US in the region um, under the, um, that group, you know, various groupings with, the, with those partners. We're looking at infrastructure needs in the region more broadly mm -hmm. and where each country has their, their value add to bring. We do take up her point on the people's thing because you know you also mentioned a bit about that you know, cons uh, the connect between the people. How do we bring that forward? Well, something that we've talked about in the dialogue today is like what Nazi was saying about the commonality around climate change and. Obviously, Australia is currently grappling with an unprecedented bushfire crisis. Yes. Um, and my hometown of Brisbane is, has dealt with um, some very severe floods in the past couple of decades. Something that was identified in the Peter Varghese report was that India is also in need of good um, monsoon awareness and um, disaster relief alert systems. So that is something that Australia is getting better and better at, unfortunately, by necessity. So I guess these are opportunities where we can look at what we have in common, what we're trying to do together, and use the people who are here committed to doing those things to push those things forward. And sustainable development is something you talked about. Can I talked about in my first speech about trying to be a good ancestor. So I guess when I approach things as a MP, I think first and foremost about are we making decisions um, that makes us good ancestors for our children and our grandchildren? And mm. something that concerns me at the moment is that we haven't taken decisive enough action to mitigate climate change. The experience happening in Australia at the moment, the bushfire crisis demonstrates that it's here, it's upon us. Mm. We needed to have acted acted 10 years ago, but if we can't act in retrospect, we can at least act today. So those are things that concerns me, uh, concern me and I know concern others having to spend a day in dialogue with my colleagues here. But uh, see, her concerns are climate change and all, but for us that is a concern, but not the most important concern. So there is... Uh... I don't agree that uh, that is not one of the uh, most yeah. impor important concerns because we have seen in the last session of the parliament, we almost debated like uh, uh, we had this uh, almost 50 days on the, on the pollution regarding Delhi uh, and I have uh, myself have uh, um, made a, uh, a speech on that saying we are having a, a seasonal debates mm. um, in the in the month of uh, say December November December we are having a debate on pollution and you forget and, it mm -hmm. and, uh, and and in the next uh, next session and coming in in the summer we are having a debate on water scarcity and in the next session, when we have, when, uh, if you have a session mm. in the uh, during the uh, during the rainy season, we are we are having a uh, we, could, we could have a deba yeah. debate on, on water how, logging. <laughs> on, uh, yeah, well, how Mumbai and Chennai and all these cities are drowning. So we're having these issues, okay. which are affecting our economy. So uh, we have to find find the solutions for the, for these. Uh, and uh, um, uh, and there are few examples where um, a country like Australia has found some answers for that. Mm. So. This is that that is where we need to collaborate. That is that, that is okay. where we need to have the collaborative research research funding that that, that is supposed to happen. Not only there, um, we can uh, think of um, we we both have the pr problem with the, our indigenous populations. Uh, problem in the sense like uh, there's so much income di disparity between between what what normal Australians have or the indigenous Australians have. Even in, even in India, we we have the same issue with the, our scheduled tribes as well as with 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 other people. So how we can 
uh, how we can Integrate. bridge that gap. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 that is where the di dialogue can happen and uh, see where where, where uh, we can converge. Huh? So these are the issues. Uh, I, I won't say that uh, climate uh, climate change and the issues with that is uh, is not a priority for India because it's taking so much. Uh, you know, uh, GDP or, or, or out of out of it. So it's a priority for India. But at the same time, as a, a, uh, as he was mentioning, uh, we need to find areas where uh, top priority areas, like 10 areas or 15 areas, where Australia and India can collaborate. That can only happen when 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 we have. Uh, free trade agreement, bilateral agreements happen because this what is. What he spoke was structural. Yeah, the, 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 we have passed a time uh, where uh, the global trade has happened. Uh, have happened. a bilateral comprehensive agreement. Yeah, com comprehensive agreement, which we, yeah, we, which which we have walked out unfortunately, and also with Australia, we, which we we supposed to have FTA, uh, which we have negotiated it for almost six years or seven years, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, which uh, I, I, for some unknown reasons it hasn't it has not. Been been, uh, you know, know. Uh, 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 it has not been signed upon. So these are the issues uh, where we can, we both can partner. Uh, maybe doubling our farmers' income. Mm -hmm. They have, uh, they have technology there, which can help us uh, do smart farming. So these are the issues that we can, uh, we can, we can develop on mm -hmm. if we have that bilateral agreement going, and if we can sit together and uh, discuss on the top priority areas. Okay, and you are the geopolitical expert also. How do you? Yeah, uh, just uh, we discussed climate change, we discussed people-to-people -people ties, we discussed economic cooperation. Um, one natural next step, the next area of cooperation is the strategic area mm. because both India and Australia are Indian Ocean countries and Indian Ocean region or Indo-Pacific region, if you borrow it from the Americans, uh, is uh, getting more and more geopolitical leverage in recent time. Uh, with the rise of China on the one side and America's pivot to the Asia. Mm. So, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, you look at the foreign policy perspective, uh, one major uh, development that's unfolding over the last few years is the quadrilateral negotiations between these four uh, countries, the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. So, uh, initially, Australia was reluctant. Uh, in 2008, Australia had actually pulled out of uh, these negotiations because uh, I think Australia didn't want to antagonize China because China was seeing Quad as, a, as an attempt to contain its rise in the region. But uh, last year, uh, the negotiations were revived. Mm. And India was also a bit guarded because India also doesn't want to be seen as a strategic ally of the United States in the region, but at the same time, it wants to deepen ties with these countries. So it is, at this point of time, it is still in the initial stages of uh, quadrilateral negotiations. But we don't know if it is going to take proper, you know, uh, structures of uh, geopolitical alliance in the region, in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, with these four democracies coming together. So right now they are not talking anything about China, but it's obvious that the elephant is uh, the elephant in the room is China. The dragon in the room. <laughs> yeah, the dragon in the room. Yeah, whatever. Uh, so of course uh, the the foreign policy uh, component is also very important when it comes to Indo-Australian relations. I think he's the skeptic in the room. Are you equally <laughs> skeptical about what I say? Um, equally skeptical about. Whether it is going to t take off or we're going to be, you know, there's a the ghost of China, US, other compulsions on us. Yeah, I, well, I would say um, Australia, so it's, it's interesting that you say that the, the Quad uh, negotiations were uh, reinvigorated and at the same time, um, Australia actually took a stance that we saw uh, domestically and it was really interesting to see that shift away from um, being... Uh, as gentle as we could with the, the China dragon problem, um, and then uh, starting to take a, a bigger stance. And we really saw that uh, with what was happening in the US, and, and I think at that time, um, our politicians took some heat from that, and it's been interesting to see that debate happening ever since. That said, they're still our biggest trading partner, um, and where we appear to be um, increasing our ties and, and what we do there. Um, this is said as a, a, a company owner and, and someone that's looking from an outside view. Uh, but it's really been interesting to see that change in behavior as time goes on and, and uh, what appears to be Australia's attempt to re-pivot itself um, to look to other allies in the region. Yes. Your last word on the 
Uh, I think we, uh, Australia has some systems in place that we really need to uh, look and learn from, mm. uh, of especially of a diverse community living together uh, and living together in a way that is, keeps the country stable. So what we see right now within India, uh, different regions, uh, you know, not cooperating with each other, if I can put that lightly, uh, uh, and differences, you know, being uh, there rather than the, the unity and diversity that India was usually would be very proud of, or the fact that today our, uh, uh, it, it's becoming unpredictable in India. I mean, to do business in India, you would want a country that's stable. Uh, internally and not have you know so frequent internet shutdowns, uh, arbitrariness in terms of the way the law and all of order policy is going. So um, uh, I think we need to learn from uh, from countries that have in place a diversity that they protect and nourish. And uh, yes, I think uh, that I would help in. I think there's a lot she's not saying, but she said a lot. <laughs> need to add one more point. Um, we, Australia uh, has the same issue with the immigration issues and uh, India right now is uh, having the same issues. They are dealing in a, in a different way and uh, we are trying to deal it in a different way. Uh, maybe there we can uh, we can actually you know learn from each other and uh, see how best it can be dealt with. That's one another one point where we both can uh, diverge on it. The politician on the table <laughs> speaks up finally. Well, that's it. Democracies to work together, they need to mutually agree on few fundamentals of humanity <coughs> and uh, working together on uh, values that both cherish. Values that both cherish. And apart from the values, there is also the T20 World Cup, I think, which is <laughs> being hosted cherish by you. Too. <laughs> so that's another value, I think, that we all cherish from both sides. But that's it for now. I know it's been a very hurried, short discussion, but I do hope that there are some takeaways from this. Thank you for watching this show. We'll see you again same time next week. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.